All right. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. Today we will be in the book of Ephesians. So grab your cup of coffee, your Bible, a pencil, <clears throat> pen. Don't tell me if we're done And turn to chapter 4 in your Bible. Good morning, Diana. Glad you could join us. I think you're on a roll, right? Usually you're in bed, still sleeping. L-O-L, -L, laugh out loud. <clears throat> All right, well, we have about 32 verses to go through, and so let's go ahead and, and pray. Where did you say we were? Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you, Lord God, for just such a, a beautiful rain that has come down, Father, and just washed our earth, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, that, um, that you have kept things down to a minimum. We've had some difficulties in California, Lord, with mudslides and uh, flooding in various areas, even in our own community. There's always an issue there on Mission and Etiwanda, Lord. Thought they had fixed it uh, with pumping and so forth, but apparently it, it uh, didn't work this last uh, Tuesday. <clears throat> but we thank you for your grace and for the water, Lord. We definitely need it. And it was a good rain, uh, Father. Um, we ask now, Lord, that you would just wash our hearts with your word. And challenge us this morning, Lord, as we look at the book of Ephesians. And now we move on from what God has done for us to what we need to do and strive for and, and really keep <clears throat> in our hearts as, as good principles to apply to our lives so that we can be better Christians, better reflect the, the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Diana, the other Diana. We have two Dianas. Glad you could join us. And anyone else that's watching that uh, won't give me a little thumbs up or hello, um, hello. <clears throat> please share this if, if it ministers to you, and I'll remind you of that at the end. Just hit your share button and put it on your wall or any uh, favorite pages that you might have or even to our community. <clears throat> All right, so Paul here is moving from what God has done for the Ephesian church and for the Christians to our responsibility as believers who have been born again. And so from chapter four to chapter six, he's going to give us instructions now uh, in this uh, letter. <clears throat> he's speaking to the Gentile church who are challenged with their culture at that time, just as we are today. One of the things that, that we struggle with as a human race is unity. Uh, as you um, <clears throat> you read the Bible from Genesis all the, all the way through to Revelation, you will find that there's always a struggle to be united together as a people. There was one instance that we find in the Bible where <clears throat> there was a unity, but it was in a negative sense. And that unity came from uh, Balaam, Nimrod. You remember that story and how he united everybody together and they began to build <clears throat> this tower, the Tower of Babel. And they call it Babel because God had confused their language so that they could no longer uh, build this tower and, and make a name for themselves. <clears throat> but other than that, <clears throat> Israel struggled to be in unity. There was always a civil war, even between Israel and the various uh, <clears throat> tribes that God had raised up through, through Jacob and his sons. And, and we see that today. There's a lack of unity in our, our world, even in our political uh, arena. You know, you have the Democrats, you have the Republicans, and then you have the various other parties, Libertarian and so forth. <clears throat> and there's a lack of unity there that um, definitely we need to work on. 
and come to a unity of at least respect for the office and for the positions that are, are there. <clears throat> we see uh, it trickle down to each state and, and the struggles there and even in the church itself. And Paul is talking to the church here and how the church needs to be in unity. But it seems like the church is really not in unity. Uh, there's a lot of areas where we uh, disagree doctrinally and, and even morally in some issues. <clears throat> uh, some of those churches that that are in existence today that are leaning towards immoral acts, <clears throat> are they really a part of the church or, or are they more <clears throat> into the cultural um, <clears throat> agenda and not necessarily being a moral church that, are, that is run by scriptures? Uh, that's the dilemma <clears throat> that we find in the church today. Uh, but yet God wants us to be in unity. I used to listen to, to Walter Martin he was the original Bible answer man, and he was great at what he did, loved him to death. He uh, would, would take questions from people on the radio, and he would just answer them like this. And you'd go on to the next one, so you would hear a lot of questions uh, from him. And, and he had this saying uh, that just resonated in my heart, because uh, we are human, and we have our own intellect and ideas and thoughts, and, and really... Um, there's a difference in the way that we, we think. Our processes are, are totally different at times. And he understood that even, even within the, the, the leadership of Christianity, some of the pillars uh, thought differently on, on different doctrines <clears throat> and scriptures in the Old Testament and New Testament. And he'd have this saying where he would say that we can learn to disagree agreeably. You know, that we would have those disagreements, but we can learn to still love each other, you know, respect each other. Uh, be loyal to each other, uh, be committed and surrendered to Christ together, and, and try to find the commonality. And, and that's been the struggle in the church today, is finding that commonality where we can be united. We can be united in the fundamentals of Christianity, right? The, the basic beliefs that Jesus was a man, that he was God in the flesh, uh, that he did walk among us. Uh, he died for our sins. He was crucified at the cross. He was buried, and then on the third day, he resurrected from the dead. His virgin birth also being one of those foundational truths that we have. And we can be united in those foundational truths. And as long as those foundational truths are there, uh, then we should have some sort of unity. And so this is what Paul is striving for, is, is unity. Now, if there is no unity, we, we need to remember that there is supposed to be respect for one another. And that's something we lack in our, our nation. We use the words tolerance, uh, <clears throat> and it's defined so, so incorrectly in our culture. Um, we use the word respect one another, and yet we really don't respect uh, people that don't believe the same that, that, that we do. And from time to time, you know, we're challenged in, to respect one another. Um, I have been challenged in that area. There are times where someone disagrees with me, and instead of respecting their opinion and, and their freedom to believe what they want to believe, I, I sometimes get a little, a little rubbed the wrong way, you know, and, and just kind of try to defend myself or defend uh, my, my belief or moral value. <clears throat> and I really shouldn't. I should express the love of God and, and allow them that respect to believe what they want to believe. But can we work together? Uh, that's another issue. Can we work together in unity in those foundational truths so that we can further the, the kingdom of God? That's what is important. So he goes on, and he gives us really the purpose because he's been telling us what God has done for us, and now he tells us what the purpose of his writing is. And, and the whole chapter deals with unity. So let's go ahead and read in chapter 4 of Ephesians. I therefore... And of course, when he says, therefore, he's, he's saying now in light of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and all that God has done for us, says, the prisoner, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep, and, and that word keep is an action, this is where free will uh, enters into uh, our actions, that we literally make an effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so Paul is saying here is that we ought to walk worthy, that is how we're living our lives, that it ought to reflect the light of Christ, the salt of Christ, 
the morality of Christ and how he walked, we should be more like Christ Jesus, that we should walk in our calling in loneliness and gentleness uh, in this life. Long-suffering, bearing with one another in, in love, and then endeavoring to keep the unity uh, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so respecting one another, even though we don't have any, even though we have differences, in our understandings, yet we should still respect one another. And then he goes on and he explains um, how the Trinity is in perfect unity. Now this is the goal, right, is to be in unity. And that's his goal and that's Christ's goal. Then one day we will be in unity when we get to heaven. We'll, we'll know everything as Christ knows all things and we'll be in unity. So he gives us an example of the perfect unity and that is the, the Trinity and how the Trinity is in perfect unity here. He says in verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope and your calling of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in, in, and in you all. Now, he's not Southern in saying you all, <laughs> but he says you all. So those of you from back east, uh, get the southern lingual there of Paul. But he's basically saying to us here that there's only one way, and that way is through the Father sending his Son and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And when you look at the Trinity, that whole doctrine of the Trinity, and the word Trinity is not, not mentioned in the Bible, but we see the doctrine there. We see the Father, we see the Son, and we see the Holy Spirit. We see that they're all, all one. First John says all three are one. We see that the Father is the head of the Trinity, then you have the Son, and then you have the Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Son to the earth with the plan of God, and then the Holy Spirit empowers him uh, to live that life and to fulfill that plan. And we see that perfect unity working. The Father is the one who directs. He has the role to direct, to lead, to plan, and so forth. Then the Son is obedient to the Father in everything. Jesus even said that, I obey the Father in everything, everything. There's nothing that the Son uh, did not do that the Father asked him to do. And then the Holy Spirit empowers him and, and pushes uh, the light and, and the uh, magnifying glass, in a sense, towards Christ. He doesn't reflect himself or push himself, he pushes Jesus Christ that we would be focused on him. And so you see that perfect unity. Uh, and, and that unity should also be in the family, the, the, the husband, the wife, and the children, a perfect example of a trinity there. Uh, the husband leading the family as the priest of his home, the wife submitting to the husband uh, and doing the things that need to be done, and the children reflecting uh, <clears throat> that family and their purpose. Uh, so we see unity in in the Trinity. And then he goes on and he gives us uh, uh, the means for, for unity and the gifts that God has given to us and how we ought to use them for unity. Verse 7, But to each one of us grace uh, was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Uh, your gifts that you have are by grace. God has given you those gifts. Uh, he has equipped you with those gifts. You cannot say that those gifts are your own gifts and they come from your personality or your nature. No, they come from an outside source and that source is God. And he has given them to you to use for his glory. And this is one of the errors of the church today. There's so many people that just think God has, has blessed us with salvation and so let me just live my life now uh, the way that I want to live it. I, I, wanna, I wanna work. I want to provide for my family. I want to go on vacation. I want to enjoy life. And, and that's pretty much how they live their life with never really investing in the kingdom of God. They're not serving. They're not using that gift that God has given to them. And so Paul makes it clear here that to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascends on high, he led captives, captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He, all, <clears throat> he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. Now he's talking about his, his death and resurrection there. That Jesus descended, set the captivity, captives free in Abraham's bosom, and then he ascended.
And then you remember in Acts chapter 1 when he's talking to the disciples and they're all looking at Jesus after he has read and his pastor said, oh, that's easy. Become a pastor and you'll, be, you'll get out of financial struggle. See, you don't, you don't choose to become a pastor to get out of anything. You don't choose to become a pastor because it's a good career choice or maybe even because you are a great speaker or because people are attracted to you because you're, you're uh, charismatic. You become a pastor, you become an evangelist, you become a, a, a um, what's, what's the word that I'm looking for here? Um, teacher or even an apologetist because God has called you to that position. And that's the big difference there. God has to call you to that position where he anoints you and fills you with the spirit to fulfill that role within your community. I was um, speaking with another pastor yesterday and he just celebrated his 25th year anniversary as a pastor in the church that he started. We will celebrate ours next year. But he was saying that he was talking to someone that did some statistics. And he said that um, for a person who started a church and has endured 25 years, the, the chances of that is, um, what was the percent? It was like uh, 2%, very low. 2% of that 100% that started church in the last 25 years is only 2%. So that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, but it doesn't speak of the pastor. It speaks of, of God's calling upon that pastor, that it's not a career choice. It's a calling of God and his obedience to that. So God has called pastors, apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Now, why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to what? The unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to a measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. There's a lot right here that I wish I could spend a lot of time. But, but the <coughs> pastors, uh, these positions are called to equip the saints. Um, there, is an, there is an authority there, an authority that is supposed to be utilized in love and expressed in gentleness and loneliness, as Paul said earlier. But when that is functioning correctly within the body of Christ, the body of Christ should respond with growth and with unity. <clears throat> they should be slowly moving away from the cultural system into a godly system, into the kingdom of God. And they should be growing there and working effectively there in unity for the growth of the body of Christ. That's how it is supposed to work. <clears throat> That's how it functions. Tonight, as we look at uh, Exodus chapter 22, we've been actually looking at three chapters where God is giving a judicial system and, and various laws for the children of Israel. Um, and what is interesting is that God raises up these judges to rule over the people. And so as they struggle with these life issues, they bring these issues to the judges and the judges make those decisions. Uh, and, and they're to adhere by that. That's the structure that God has established. Their responsibility as people is to be obedient to the judges as the, as the judges are seeking God in what to do with, in this situation. Using pastors and teachers and those in leadership to judge the matters of the church. He even tells us in Corinthians, why do you take these matters to the world? You ought to be judging these matters yourself within the church of God. And the responsibility of the people is those that belong to that fellowship, and I'm talking about the individual fellowships that make up the body of Christ throughout the world, as they go there, they're to submit themselves to those pastors. And they're, they're to look at them and say, well, they're, they're godly men, and they're men that we need to respect because they hold that position. And they're leading in meekness and lowliness uh, and in truth, teaching the word of God. And so if I bring the situation to them, I also need to be willing to accept their decision as God gives it to them. And that's a difficult thing to do in this day and age, but it is what God wants us to do, definitely. 
So he goes on and he says, this, this I say, brethren, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. In order to, for unity to work, you have to make a conscious effort, your own free will to make it work. You have to tell yourself, look, I am to be in unity with the body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, first I need to read my words so that I know what that means. So you read through the Old Testament. You read, read scriptures, that little app that we use. It's great. It's wonderful. And you're reading scriptures and you're getting the scriptures in you. And now you know where you need to be in unity. And so then you go and you find a place, a church where God calls you. And this is how it works. If I can explain this to you so that you understand this. Um, I was at a, at a meeting yesterday and uh, it was the first meeting of the city, Healthy Harupa. Um, uh, it was a city city put together meeting. They had various people there, and they asked everybody what their goal is for 2018, and they introduced yourself. So I said, "I'm Pastor Ruben with Calvary Chapel Inland, and my goal is to get every single one of you in the church." <laughs> and, they, and they all started laughing. But interesting that one individual came up to me afterwards and asked where the church was. So I'm expecting uh, them to come to church. Um, so, your next step as a believer, born again, is to find a church through the leading of God's Spirit. I really believe that you ought to be going to a church in your community because you belong to that community. So if you're in this community, 100,000 people in Harupa Valley, <clears throat> then you need to be seeking the Lord and saying, where is the church where I can go? Now, what kind of church should I go to? Well, you need to go to a church that is teaching sound biblical doctrine. They're teaching through the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, they're not teaching you topical messages. I love topical messages and they're great, but I believe that we ought to be taking people through the Bible so they understand how we can become in unity. And as you go through the Bible, you will understand the various topics. As, as one man said, you know, just looking up scriptures dealing with marriage isn't enough. You have to find all the other scriptures that deal with who you are so that you can be a better husband or a better spouse. So that's how you become a, a, a better uh, example in a marriage, is by knowing all the other scriptures. And so once you find that place, then you, you really have to choose to stick it out there, to be loyal to that place, to respect that leadership, to surrender yourself to God first, definitely, and then to the functioning of that church, <clears throat> and then supporting that church and being in unity within that church. And that's how you become uh, united together. You put off the old conduct and you put on the new man and you begin to grow in unity within that church. So Paul says in verse 23, putting on that man, uh, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who, him who has need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification or building up, that it may impart grace to the hearer. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ, just as God in Christ also forgave us. <clears throat> you know, Paul is, is expounding on the two greatest commandments that we see, find in the New Testament. 
You go back to the Old Testament if you're on Wednesday nights, and I encourage you to come on on Wednesday nights. We do, Calvary Chapel Inland people, we do have a Wednesday night service, and it starts at 7 p.m. I encourage you to come out and go through the Old Testament with us, and we're in Exodus right now, and we just saw God give Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, and now he's defining each of those commandments through a civil system. Jesus comes along and he says, now here's two commandments that you really only have to keep. And that is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbors yourself. You keep that, you fulfill the whole law of God, the Ten Commandments, including all the particulars. Now, Paul then defines what that means here. Holy Spirit, not quenching the Holy Spirit, but allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us these things. And so you make the choice. It's up to you. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word words of encouragement and strength. May you fill us with your Holy Spirit and empower us, Lord, uh, to live out our Christianity out loud too, Lord, that we would be a light and salt to this world, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you. If you're ministered by this, please share it on your Facebook page. The more you share it, the more the word of God goes out and people will hopefully come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.